Start? Yeah, so it seems like we're about in time, and I believe we can uh, begin. So thank you all for joining me today uh, for uh, our early first session for, the, for today. Uh, thank you for joining me after last night's parties. <laughs> actually, I was quite surprised that people actually came after the parties. I know usually people take, take their time <laughs> with their hangovers this morning. So thank you all for joining. So uh, I'm Arthur Berezin, Senior Technical Product Manager for OpenStack, uh, based out of Israel. And today I'm going to talk about uh, highly avail uh, high availability for OpenStack and basically discuss the architecture of how to build uh, an, uh, a highly available OpenStack uh, environment, basically what should we concentrate on and how, what should we resolve uh, while we're, we're building this environment. So I'm going to focus in on the enabling services that we use or that we can use uh, to build a highly available OpenStack environment and to cover all the services uh, and make sure that, that they survive failures. I'm going to discuss the, the, the various uh, shared services like MariaDB uh, and the message queuing that obviously we have to use and we have to make sure it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's fault tolerant. And going to cover the various OpenStack services, or at least the basic ones, uh, as we don't have uh, too much time today. And I'm going to end up uh, by covering some, some of the topologies and what we should we take, uh, what should, should we think about when we basically uh, build uh, such an environment. So before we be, before I begin, uh, who of you that has uh, an iPhone in his pocket? Please. All right. And Android users. All right, much more. So I'm hoping you're all familiar with the QR function. <laughs> you can use it now instead of taking photos during the slide deck. So feel free to, uh, to take a shot of, of, of the QR code and just download the, uh, the deck on, on, slide, uh, on SlideShare. All right, and I'm going to share that by the end of the session as well. So if you don't have a chance to actually do it now, uh, you'll be able to do it uh, by the end of the session as well. So, this is the environment we're trying to build, right? We're building our top-notch environment with uh, high-performing uh, uh, high performing compute nodes, high-performing uh, controller nodes, and everything should be always running and uh, without, without uh, to tolerating any failures on the environment. If something slips, you know, just by, by just a millisecond, so we are lost the race. But, as we all know, Reality is not, not always that simple. Obviously, uh, all right. Yeah. So obviously, <laughs> failures do happen, and we have to encounter for them. And something fails with OpenStack. Obviously, if one of the controlling services fails, it doesn't mean like the actual virtual machines stop functioning, right? The environment still probably keeps on running, depending on the failure, obviously. Uh, but it is extremely important to make sure our controllers, controlling services uh, are fault tolerant and if something happens uh, while the environment runs and things always happen, <laughs> so we need to make sure uh, we have another spare wheel that actually controls the car uh, after the failure occurs. 
So we are trying to build the active active services. We don't want to wait for failovers to happen because failovers take time. Uh, it takes time to start another service on another node, for example, or, uh, or uh, bring the first node uh, uh, to, uh, to keep on running. So we have to make, uh, we, we would like to make everything as active active as possible. Obviously there are some limitations in OpenStack today that, that we're still trying to solve and it will take us another cycle or two to solve them. Uh, and there are lots of uh, very good progress on, on, the, on the other services as well. Uh, so, and again, if nothing else, uh, if, if the service itself uh, does not support active-active configuration, uh, so obviously we can still fall back to active-passive, uh, but we would like to do that as least as possible. And we would like to create a scale-out environment, right? We want to make sure our environment can serve as many requests as possible and, and uh, serve as many users as possible. And this is the reality. We've all seen this, uh, this diagram. Obviously, OpenStack is a fairly complex system uh, constructed out of many services, and we need to make sure that each and every one of them uh, is highly available. So first, we're gonna, I'm going to cover uh, some of the enabling technologies that we use to, to build a highly available environment. So the first is Spacemaker. So Pacemaker is a cluster resource manager. Basically, uh, what it does, it mon monitors a bunch of resources that it supports. And once it detects something happened with one of its resources, it makes sure uh, it's, uh, the resource uh, uh, comes back to life, either by restarting the service or, or by, by uh, fencing the node. And we're going to cover that just in a bit. So Pacemaker supports various uh, types of resources. One of them is the virtual IP, which is basically a floating IP that can move from one host to another. Uh, and basically the virtual IP resists on one host uh, and having a single IP address for both, uh, both uh, nodes that run the service. Uh, Pacemaker also supports uh, system D monitoring, uh, monitoring of system D services. So we don't run the services themselves by system D, rather, Pacemaker monitors those services and controls them. So we don't have to enable the system these services themselves. Pacemaker takes care of that. And Pacemaker also supports clone services, which basically mean active-active configuration. So, so uh, when a Pacemaker cluster is configured on a, in a clone configuration, the service runs actively on all the hosts uh, that, that's, that the cluster is configured on. And another uh, very important function of Pacemaker is the should the other node in the head function. <laughs> so when something weird is going on and Pacemaker is not able to actually reach the service or not able to restart the service, for example, there's a, there's a failure occurring when you restart a service or such scenarios, and we have to make sure that we have full control of the service, right? We don't want to uh, create any split brain scenarios or, or any scenarios where a service is, is out of control. So we basically should be able to uh, control the host itself by, by using its power management, uh, most commonly the IPMI uh, device for that host. So for OpenStack, we use Pacemaker basically, basically by uh, creating a virtual IP address for each, uh, for each and every API endpoint. Uh, so basically the user's address, uh, the API, uh, the virtual IP address, uh, so once, once, uh, once uh, failure occurs, obviously, you don't have to reconfigure anything and you don't have to uh, uh, let the other services know of your new, new IP address. You just use a single IP address that bounces uh, between the services themselves. We also use the system that clones the resource functionality, which means, again, Pacemaker monitors the services themselves and controls the system resources. And we configure the shoot uh, the other node in the head uh, functionality in case uh, some kind, something funky is happening in the environment. So uh, Pacemaker is constructed of a single service that runs on a host uh, called the uh, PCSD. And it uses the, 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 the IPMI uh, or the, the, the remote uh, management of that host. Another technology that we use uh, is HA proxy, which does uh, load balancing. So HA proxy is obviously a very popular uh, web, uh, web load balancer and proxy. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's capable of, of uh, handling uh, HTTP and then uh, TCP requests and does it very well. And this is why it's extremely popular for web applications. 
Uh, and it also does uh, health check monitoring. So basically, it makes sure that, that the IP addresses that it balances to are alive. And if something is happening, uh, HA proxies stop uh, distributing, stop uh, sending requests to nodes that are not responding. And obviously, it has a load distribution. So we can use uh, various load distributions with OpenStack, and it's really dependent on the service. I'm going to cover some of the services and their, their policies. Uh, but by the end of the session, I'm going to point you to their uh, complete reference architecture that, that you can uh, go over and see for, uh, for each of the services what are the recommend recommended configurations. So some of them are uh, round robin. So we have, uh, when we have completely stateless services, we don't really care uh, for the session to go to the same node every time a user makes a request. So uh, HAProxy just do does uh, load distribution and just does a uh, round robin across all the nodes it's configured to use. Or we can use stick table to make sure that the session that uh, started uh, using a, a specific node, uh, its next request, they're going to use uh, that node. So it also does the API isolation. So we don't uh, 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 address the API directly. And uh, it also does uh, failure detection, which basically, if one of the nodes fail, uh, uh, HAProxy stops uh, distributing uh, the load to that, to that node. So let's, let's go over the, the, the life cycle of su such an environment using those, uh, those components. So we'll take an example, uh, Horizon. So user try to connect and uh, tries to, to access Horizon uh, Web UI. It could be Horizon or it could be any other stateless, uh, uh, stateless uh, service. So obviously, this is a single point of failure which we would like to uh, address first. So we can put an HA proxy in front of it. An HA proxy distributes the load between the, uh, the three, uh, three uh, nodes for, for Horizon. Now, again, this still creates us a single point of failure because HA proxy by itself is a single point of failure now. And each of the Horizon components is also, could also fail, and we should, uh, we should make sure that these services are rebooted or restarted once something, something funny is going on. So we build an HA, uh, an, a pacemaker cluster, a cloned cluster, around the Horizon services. Uh, which takes, takes care of, 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 uh, of any failures for the, for, the HA prop, for the Horizon services. So if something's going on, Pacemaker basically takes care of that and reboots the service. And if it fails to reboot the service itself, it restarts the node. And for the HA proxy, we can also create a Pacemaker cluster for HA proxy itself. So if something happens to HA proxy and it fails, uh, Pacemaker can, can uh, restart the service. And also, we can use a virtual IP for this specific service. So basically, the flow uh, for, for this environment would go from specific node, that, uh, and that specific node that runs that virtual IP is going to load balance uh, the request coming in and basically uh, send it over to, to one of the Horizon instances. So for the shared services, so first of all, the database that we would like to care of, we, we can use a Galera DB. Uh, we can use Galera with Maria DB, sorry. Uh, and what Galera does is basically is, is, it is a multi-master uh, node replication for the database. It does a row-based uh, row uh, replication for the database. And it uh, basically allows us having multiple active running nodes running the database services themselves and basically access uh, each of the nodes uh, having a consistent data for, for an, across the nodes. Also supports uh, node auto joining, uh, recovery, uh, conflict resolution, etc. Lots of really cool functionalities. Basically, literally what we need to make a uh, database highly available and specifically for OpenStack, this is really a good, uh, good use case. Also supports the native, uh, the native client APIs for, uh, for MariaDB, which means we don't have to introduce any changes to the environment itself. We can just point it uh, to specific IP address uh, of that node, and basically replication takes care of, uh, happens underneath, uh, underneath the, this service. So the other functionality we use, we use uh, RabbitMQ uh, mirrored queues, another functionality, uh, clustering-enabled functionality for, uh, for RabbitMQ which basically uh, replicates the, the message queues for each of the services across multiple nodes. Uh, 
this is the functionality of, of, of RabbitMQ that we can uh, leverage here to make sure that the, 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 the message bus itself is highly available. So for the services themselves, uh, Keystone uh, is rather simple service. It runs under, under Apache, under HTTPD, uh, obviously multi-threaded. Um, and this service basically accesses all, all the identity resources and accesses the database for assignments uh, or could also store the identities in the, the, the database itself. So again, we use Pacemaker and, uh, and Keystone to make, uh, and uh, Pacemaker and, uh, and uh, HA proxy to make uh, the, uh, the uh, Keystone it's, uh, itself uh, highly available. Uh, Rather, rather simple uh, service, so we have the, uh, the virtual IP running on, on one of the nodes, and that node that has the virtual IP basically uh, makes all the load balancing uh, for the, the API calls for, for, for Keystone. And uh, the Keystone service basically does uh, access the, the environment. So the important thing to, to keep note here is that each of the hosts uh, should have the same identical SSL certifications. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, some weird behaviors. So when we're, when we're configuring this environment, we have to make sure uh, we, have, we, we co copy the, the SSL from, for all of the nodes. And we also then need to, uh, to take notice that, that the caching for each of the services is local. So uh, uh, obviously, it would be a bit more efficient to have the calls come to the same, uh, to the same node every time. So Glance is also a rather simple service. It has two uh, Linux services. One is Glance API, which takes care of all the API calls. And it also uh, accesses the storage. Uh, and we also have Glance Registry, which communicates with Glance API over HTTP calls. Uh, and Glance Registry takes care of, of registering all, uh, all the interactions with, with Glance to the, to the database. So again, here, we, as, as we used with Keystone, but this time we're doing it with, with, for, for both services, we have two virtual IP addresses. One is for, uh, for Glance API, the other is for Glance Registry. And both of them, obviously, all are load balanced uh, across the nodes. So again, as the flow, uh, we have one node running, uh, running the load balancing for the API calls and the other running the load balancing for, uh, for the registry calls. Cinder is a bit more complex service, but also not, not, not uh, that complex. We have one, one issue with it specifically. So we have four services. The first is API, which takes care of all the API calls. We have the scheduler, which, which uh, is responsible for placing volumes. So when, once I, create, I send a call to create a new volume, uh, Cinder scheduler, scheduler decides on which uh, Cinder volume uh, to, to create that, that, that specific volume, obviously based on filters and weights. And the sender volume itself makes all the storage calls. It uses basically the, the data path to the storage, uh, to the storage device uh, we're using. Rather, it could be a distributed storage or traditional storage, it doesn't really matter. It uses the driver to access, uh, the, to access the storage via, the, via the, the management path to that storage. And then the API passes to, the, to, to Nova the data path. So basically the VM accesses uh, the storage directly. So uh, the only thing to note here is basically that Cinder volume is still not capable of, of uh, running active-active due to some uh, potential condition, uh, race conditions. So, for example, if you make uh, the same uh, volume creation call uh, with multiple volumes, there, there could be some conflicts uh, uh, while the environment runs. So it is uh, currently recommended to have this uh, as an active passive configuration. But, lu but lu lucky, uh, lucky us, we have the design session as well during the OpenStack Summit. And, and basically, this is one of the topics that the Cinder developers are currently trying to address with, with various locking mechanisms. Uh, for Cinder volumes to make sure that, uh, that there aren't uh, any race conditions uh, within the service itself. And Cinder volume is still active passive as well. And I'm assuming that once the, the Cinder volume is, 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 is taken care of, we can use the same, same principles to, to apply on the Cinder backup as well. So Nova, Nova constructs of, uh, constru is constructed of Nova API service, which obviously does all the API calls. We have the Nova schedulers, which does the VM placement, chooses the VMs based on weights and filters. We have the Nova conductor, which does all the database access. 
And basically, uh, every command that, that the Nova Compute Service does, a uh, Nova Conductor makes that uh, register over to the database. And Nova Compute runs the actual virtual machine instances using various drivers, most commonly a KVM with libvirt uh, driver. So usually, uh, OpenStack is deployed uh, with, with a configuration of uh, controller services and, and compute services, and compute nodes, sorry. So, uh, so for the for the controller services, all of them are capable. All of them are basically stateless services, and all of them are capable of running uh, uh, in an active active environment without uh, without any issues. But for the compute compu the compute services themselves are still uh, their own single point of failures. We do have System D monitoring uh, the the Nova compute service. So if something happens to Nova Compute uh, System, this still tries to recover that, but we don't have any uh, virtual machine uh, VM uh, availability, and that's not, not yet fully supported. We do have some reference architectures for that, trying to solve this. Uh, and basically there are some few, there are, there are few uh, uh, blueprints for Nova to enable this, and basically make, uh, to help Nova recognize that a node failed uh, much more quickly. Uh, so there are some blueprints to cover that as well, but uh, this is not something that is uh, fully supported, at least by, by Red Hat. So the way it's going to work, once there are, there are, as I mentioned, there, there are some reference architectures trying to solve this. Uh, and the way it should work, basically, is uh, Pacemaker, we use uh, something called Pacemaker Remote. Uh, and what this means is basically that the compute service is not part of the cluster uh, for Pacemaker, since Pacemaker uh, supports only up to 16 nodes. Rather, uh, it uses this node uh, only to monitor its state with core sync, but, uh, but it doesn't do any actions on the node itself. Uh, but it still can use its, uh, its uh, controlling mechanism uh, uh, to make sure that the service is rebooted uh, once uh, something weird is going on. And once we can actually make sure that the service, uh, that the node itself was rebooted, we can start the instances on another node. Now, one little disclaimer, we're, this is still relies on shared storage for, for the VMs. So we cannot use any ephemeral storage on local disk, obviously. This, this will not work on local storage. So Neutron, one of the, I think, the most complex services today with, with OpenStack, constructed out of several services. The first is the Neutron server, which does all the API calls and all the management for Neutron, runs all the commands, etc. uses the message bus to, uh, to communicate uh, with all its services. And the, this is the only service that actually makes, the, uh, makes uh, database calls uh, uh, and saves all the uh, in all the states of the of the uh, networks uh, over the database. It also has a layer two agent, uh, mo uh, most commonly used with with Open vSwitch, but also there's a, uh, a bunch of other uh, underlying supporting te technologies, uh, Linux bridges and other vendors uh, plugins for layer three, uh, layer two uh, agents. Uh, the layer three agent is, is a more interesting service. Uh, it's, uh, it does all the routing and all the uh, SNAT configuration for Neutron, basically allowing, allowing uh, north, northbound, con uh, northbound connections or routing uh, between uh, virtual uh, networks for, for, uh, for uh, Neutron. So we also have uh, the DHCP agent which uh, gives us uh, DHCP services for the agents, for the instances. So once we boot an agent, once we boot uh, an instance, it gets its IP from, uh, from the DHCP agent, which uh, uses the NS mask uh, in the default configuration. And we also have the load balancing as a service agent, which uses, uh, which uses HA proxy for, for load balancing. So if we take a look at the flow of the environment, we have, uh, again, this is, the, this is a common deployment, uh, deployment, uh, deployment mode. So if we take a look at this environment, we have on all the, net, all the nodes that actually uh, do, a network act and do any networking activity, and this is obviously the compute nodes and the neutral network nodes. Uh, those, uh, those hosts run the layer two agents which are basically responsible for, for configuring the layer two configuration on those nodes, on those nodes and basically constructing all that, uh, creating all the tunneling needed uh, for, for, for communication, uh, et cetera. And we have the neutral network node running the, LA, the layer three agent, which, which does all the routing 
and creates all the routers uh, to, uh, um, to basically uh, enable uh, communication between uh, between various uh, tenants and also uh, enable com communication to to the outside world to the to the external network or to the internet obviously so the neut the neutrons the neutron service itself is rather rather easy it's uh, the neutron Neutron server, not Neutron API. Uh, this is a rather easy service. It's it's stateless service as, as as much as any other API service. So there's no no problem running it in a cloned configuration, and make it run on all the nodes simultaneously. And the DHCP. So there are, there were a few changes in the latest cycle in Kilo cycle, basically that enabled. Uh, running the DHCP agent in active active configuration and this is a, a neutron configuration that you would have to enable and you would also have to make sure that the neutron DHCP service the Linux service that runs on the host it's uh, that it is highly available as well so you, you, will, you would have to create the pacemaker cluster on top of that in addition to the, to the neutron configuration uh, enabling the DHCP services uh, being highly available, high, highly available. So the second part is also the layer three agent, which is responsible for creating the virtual routers uh, on, the, on the network nodes. Uh, so there, there also, this also relies on, on various changes uh, happened in, in the Kilo cycle, basically enabling uh, VRRP uh, between the layer three agents. So what it does, basically it creates another, the service itself, the, the Linux service runs in a cloned configuration. So the Linux service is, is active, active on, across the nodes, but each of the nodes, since there is communication between the layer three agents over uh, over VRRP, uh, we create another another passive router on, on another node. So in this example, if if this layer three agent fails, we already have a passive uh, configuration for a router uh, for this environment. So if this node fails, uh, the other router will, will become. Uh, will become active and will start uh, uh, serving as, as the router for this environment. So as I mentioned, another changes, a few changes happen in the Kilo cycle, uh, basically enabling HA for, uh, with, with VRRP for the layer three agent, which, which, which was one of the uh, major fa uh, failure points for Neutron. Also enabled the uh, uh, HA for, for the DHCP agent. And there are some plans for, for Liberty as well to enable DVR, which, which allow us uh, to create distributed virtual routers on each of the compute nodes. So what this would mean is basically we would have, a, 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 we would have the routers distributed across all the nodes, so we wouldn't have to create a, a, the, the single, a, single a neutron controller nodes, neutron and nodes. And another very, very interesting configuration is basically running uh, the DVR, distributed virtual routing, alongside with VRRP. So for example, we would have the routing themselves done uh, within the compute nodes, <coughs> but running the, the northbound traffic, accessing, the, ex accessing the external networks uh, using VRRP. So this would actually give us a really, a really reliable environment that we, uh, would be able to access it, would be able to segregate uh, the external networks but also uh, make uh, the east, east uh, to west traffic uh, be routed more w without going to the neutron node. And uh, there's another initiative also ma making the, the DHCP uh, services fully distributed, but this is uh, still not, not, not fully targeted and this is still, still uh, under, uh, under research. So going to, back to Horizon, one of our simplest uh, services, again, Horizon uses all the APIs to display its data and to make any, any, uh, any changes in the environment. It, it does uh, all the direct API calls for all the services and it's uh, as, as simple as Keystone actually from, from, the, the, from the architectural perspective. A simple Django application uh, making the API calls under, under Apache HTTPD. So again, we're, we're, uh, we have here a single, simple, uh, rather simple uh, active active uh, pacemaker configuration with uh, with HA proxy configured. So I'm gonna address this a bit cautiously since uh, each and every one of us has his own environment, is uh, interested in implementing his own best practice or his own use case. There are multiple use cases for OpenStack, obviously. We all love OpenStack because it's a, such a robust system that can allow us basically do uh, configure uh, those configurations. So the most common configuration is, is uh, multiple controller nodes. 
<coughs> is a three controller node, the environment running all the services, including the database, including the, the, the message bus, and all the, all the controlling services, uh, and having multiple uh, compute nodes accessing the environment, and uh, ser serving, the VM, uh, serving as the VM hosts. But we can also obviously segregate some of the services. So we can, for example, push, pull uh, the Neutron services uh, to run on, on their own separate dedicated nodes. Uh, for example, to have all the, all the networking uh, traffic uh, covering, uh, covered by those nodes, but make sure our APIs are segregated from the network nodes, for example. Another example we could use, we could, uh, we could use our store, could segregate our storage nodes uh, basically covering Cinder and Glance on, on their own dedicated uh, hosts accessing the storage without enabling access to, the, our, to our data store, to our storage devices by the controllers, for example, running the API services. Obviously, another, another example would be to segregate uh, the message bus and database to the, their own dedicated hosts. And this, this basically allows us uh, to, uh, to make the environment more scalable since we are, we are able to, to serve more, more, uh, more calls by each of the services. So some resources, uh, you, you got there the QR code to download the deck. There are a few re really interesting resources and then really a great blog posts on, on the various components. I uh, highly recommend going over them. And there are a bunch of really great talks, uh, both by Reddit guys and by, by uh, guys actually deploying such environments in the real world, basically discussing various trade-offs, uh, which services could you use, basically covering uh, pacemaker versus uh, Keep Alive Deer or many other configurations. So I highly recommend going over the list uh, during the schedule. There are a bunch of really great talks I highly recommend. Thank you. And you can download the code if you like, download the deck if you like. And if you have any questions, there's a mic over there, so feel free to uh, go over the mic and, have, uh, and ask questions. Any one question? Yeah, what is the, the status of, uh, I, I noticed you didn't mention like the twos library and any of the zookeeper work to overcome some of the problems that people were having with the Morera DB Glare problems with the locking. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah. So the question was, uh, how do we address the locking issues with, with, with uh, Maria? So yeah, there are some locking issues where resulting some, uh, some conflicts that you would have to manually resolve. At the moment, the best practice is to use a single node to, for the write access. So it wouldn't create any, uh, any conflicts and multiple nodes to, 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 for reading uh, for readings, and this basically avoids the conflicts. But again, this is still under investigation f from the Galera team itself, so it should be resolved sometime soon, hopefully. Um, this is uh, from scaling perspective. So we can start with the three controllers initially, but then how do we go about identifying the scaling bottlenecks? Yeah, so the question was how do we identify the, the, the the bottleneck. So this is a good question, and this, this is actually a, a really kind of tough thing that you would have to go service by service and identify the bottlenecks. Uh, there are various tools for, for performance measuring, making sure you know uh, which of the components, which of the services is your bottleneck, and then scaling that specific service out, you know, node by node, making sure uh, your environment uh, survives, uh, survives the scale that, that you're serving. But basically, the best practice today is basically going service by service and identifying the bottlenecks themselves and then addressing them specifically. Do you have any like uh, use cases for the uh, leveraging this HA mechanism for the upgrade, for example? Because like you have uh, three controllers, so uh, you can do like upgrade one of the controllers while another one is active. I don't know if you have like uh, experience plans or can you comment on that? Yeah. So upgrades. So. <laughs> Yeah, so at the moment, uh, do you mean like any automatic upgrades or just upgrades in general? No, just upgrade in general because if you have a three controllers, yes, yeah, so you can basically just shut down one of the controllers, do the upgrade, right? And while the other two are still active and running. Yeah, so there, there are various strategies with <coughs> upgrading. You can do this by you know, running controller by controller upgrade. This is one strategy. Another strategy you could take, you can run service by service upgrades. 
This but is also possible in some some some. But some you guys don't have like a clear reference how to do so, this. So yeah, right? we, so actually we do have uh, <laughs> we, do, we do address all of them in in, in our documentation, uh, running both multiple service uh, running uh, sim uh, simultaneous controllers or service by service. Again, it's up to the use case. Uh, mm. There aren't uh, any like that. There isn't any like best of them, right? So yeah, you would have to choose your own strategy. So my next question is about some of the services on your presentation were covered by the systemd. So systemd can make sure that service is running, right? And in the same time, they were covered by pacemaker. Are you aware about no, any yeah. problems or conflict with this? Because exactly. I see that there's a potential place where you can have, a, like in edge case scenarios, you can have problems and kind of tricky to troubleshoot and resolve them. Exactly. So the question was, what happens when I have a service managed by, by, by so our service is managed by, uh, by systemd or by pacemaker. So exactly. So you don't run the services managed by both. You would have to enable them only in, sing, in a Either single place. Either by systemd or pacemaker. Exactly. Yeah. Either systemd or pacemaker. So for example, for VMHA, you would have to make that run by pacemaker and not systemd. But most commonly it's done uh, via systemd. Hey, I can answer that a little bit. Oh. So, uh, microphone, come on. Yeah. We want to hear you. <laughs> Pacemaker actually coordinates with systemd. So Pacemaker can speak to systemd and say, systemd, I want you to start this, but I want to have control over it. So Pacemaker is actually controlling services through systemd in a way. So um, systemd in itself can automatically restart and monitor things, but um, Pacemaker can start a service and say, I don't want you, system D, to actually monitor this. I want to monitor it, um, and I want to have complete control over the service, but we're utilizing the fact that system D has these nice unit files and things like that for Pacemaker to manage. So, yeah. Maybe that makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, guys, thank you so much, and thanks for making this early session.